Beloved and friends, we are at a passage in Romans 6 that is epic. Let's begin here. Most appropriate, I want to begin and end with this theme, that you were created by God to glorify him and enjoy him forever. And let's break down this principle of glorifying and enjoying in a summary. You were created by God to love God. Love has a unique principle about it, a unique property in that it makes much of the thing that it loves. And in so doing, it rejoices in it. So you were made to love God. In fact, when our Lord Jesus Christ walked this planet, he was asked this question, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus responded, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Uahavta et Yahweh Eloheka, Bekal, Levavka, Uvkal, Nefshka, Uvkal, Meodaka. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. It is the reason why you exist. It is the purpose for your being. But the grand tragedy of the human life and experience is that Sin has separated us from our God. And in that sin, the natural mind, the mind, the heart, the soul, the inner person cannot and will not love the Lord your God. It will not glorify and enjoy him. Because sin is separate us from our God, the natural person, the natural mind is defunct by default. And defunct is a word that means that it cannot function according to its designed purpose. Oh, I know that there are many intelligent people that are not Christian. And I assert to you, that their mind does not function according to its intended purpose. You can be a chess master and still be mastered by sin. Intellect is not the purpose of the mind. If you think intellect means simple mathematical computation, cognitive quotients. No, your mind exists to love God. Your mind exists to glorify God and to enjoy him. And so here we have this great theme that really helps us to understand what Paul is communicating in Romans 6. Because we must begin here that the mind, the mind left to itself, the mind of the natural man is indeed futile because it is fallen, it is deceitful, it is debased, it is darkened, it is hostile, it is incurably sick, it is spiritually dead. That's the condition of the natural mind. And this, therefore, is a subject of deep import, one that can scarcely be overemphasized. The use of our minds. You see, Paul has labored to show us at the outset of Romans, in chapter 1, he's unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And he says that in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And then he launches into his thesis, and he begins by showing that all people everywhere, without exception, are really and radically corrupt and culpable. Corrupt and culpable defines chapter 1, 2, and 3. The natural mind is defunct. It does not love the Lord, it's God. It does not glorify him and enjoy him. The natural mind is on a road to destruction. 
But the whole purpose of the gospel, the whole reason we're not ashamed of it is because it starts there and then it moves into chapter 3, verse 21. And there he unfolds really what the good news is. And the good news is that you can be made right with God. You can be set right with God, put right with a holy God, even when your mind is defunct. By grace alone, God steps into our condition, and by grace alone, Christ dies in the place of sinners. And by that death, sin is punished. And those who trust in him receive his righteousness and have taken away from them their sin. That gospel message is where we become right with God by faith alone, in Christ alone, a work of grace alone. And that's what Paul has labored to show us in chapter 3, verse 21, to chapter 4, to chapter 5. And when he starts chapter 5, he introduces now a third movement in the gospel. Understanding all are corrupt and culpable moves to understanding how to be right with God. It's faith alone moves to understanding life in Christ. Everything to this point has been outside of us, but Paul is anxious to take the grand theology of the gospel and pour it into our very lives that we, we, sinners saved by grace, might love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So with that in mind, his focus has been grace. Grace, not our work, not our doing, not our goodness. Grace. Romans 4, 5, he said it this way. To the one who does not work, does not obey laws, the one who is not good enough, doesn't clean themselves up, but to the one who is like that and yet believes, by faith alone, believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. It's a work of grace. And so the question we come to in chapter 6 follows from chapter 5. And, and it's this idea of life in Christ. But the question that is pressing on Paul's heart, the question that he gives us in chapter 6, is if this is true, if it's all of grace, if I'm counted righteous by faith alone and not by my deeds, then the question is, if God has done everything, then what, what must I do? If I'm righteous because of what Christ has done, then why do I need to do anything righteous? Does it have any place then in the life of one who claims the gospel? Well, last week we looked at the structure of chapter 6. It's all about grace. He starts out in verse 1 to, to all the way to verse 14, really. And it's a stress on grace abounding, which is an echo of 520. Romans 520, how he ends the last chapter. Romans 520, grace abounding. So the first part of Romans 6 answers that. The second part of Romans 6, starting in verse 15, answers 521. The next point, which is, Grace reigning. Grace abounding and grace reigning. It's all grace. So last week we began chapter 6 by reminding, by seeing and understanding that the first point, look at it with me in verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And the first point we noticed was the absurdity of disgrace. To claim Christ and disgrace him by opposing grace itself in our thoughts, words, actions, affections. That this is absurd. It's absurd. The, the, the reality is, while sin is an occasion for grace, grace is never an occasion for sin. It, we then moved on to understand the application of grace. And that's where we are today. 
the absurdity of disgrace, and then the application of grace. Paul labors to show from verse 3 and following this application. How do you apply grace then? This is really where I want to move into and see the wonders of what he has for us in this passage. Let's just put this out there very clear and keep in mind. Some people might think, okay, so if it's a work of God and I'm justified by faith alone, then I should expect after being justified that I don't sin anymore. I should expect, and basically you could put whatever you want in there. And what you will be tempted to think is that justification goes immediately to glorification. Like you're without sin. You're without, you're without the presence of sin. You're without, there's no power of sin and there's no penalty. It all comes in one package is, is almost the temptation of thought. But if you believe that, and you walk out of hearing a message about justification, and you actually begin to live, you will very quickly be deeply discouraged because you will sin. And that's what he's dealing with. He has to address the issue of the human experience of being simul impeccator et peccator. Both at the same time, Luther said, Eustus et peccator, justified and yet a sinner. That struggle, well, we've got to stay with his logic. It is profound and he has moved from the outside and he's going to be moving to the inside. I want us to see three principles of redeemed thinking. I submit to you that the purpose of the whole thing here is for you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you stray from that principle, you, you will get lost in the details and you will misuse the doctrines of sanctification and the teaching of Romans 6. If you stray from the purpose of the gospel, so let's see these three principles of redeemed thinking. The mind being redeemed to think thoughts that make much of Christ, that love him with all heart, soul, mind, and strength, enjoying him in life and in death. First principle, the centrality of Christ. Please mark it down. The centrality of Christ. Oh, that should put a smile on your face that you never grow tired of hearing the centrality of Christ even when answering the hard questions about how is it that I'm justified by faith but I still sin. Centrality of Christ. Listen, look at it with me. I want you to think about this. Some people, I've listened to sermons on this passage. Some people take Romans 6 and, six and say, okay, all right, people, here's, here's the deal. We've dealt with justification. We're turning the chapter. We're now moving into a different gear. And we're looking now at the manual of sanctification. And I'm not interested in criticizing. I simply want to say, that's not the best way to look at Romans 6. Paul hasn't changed gears. I think he just took a breath and he keeps speaking. And his heart is flowing. It's still engaged in the very same gear. There's no switch. It's all about Christ from start to finish. And the point that he's getting at now is not about a manual for you to be sanctified. I want you to see the centrality of Christ. What we must remember is that Paul here in verse 5 and following is still answering that question. Shall we sin that grace may abound? He's still answering that question. And we ought to remember that we, you know, might expect him to answer, well, I know I talked about it being all of grace, but let me qualify that. Or let me, let me, let me augment a little bit of what I mean. You must do... Hmm. He doesn't do that. He doesn't modify the doctrine of grace 
so that you won't sin. People think you can't tell people that they can never out sin grace. Because if you tell them that, they're going to go off with a license to sin. And I say, yeah, if you tell an unregenerate heart that, it's true. But if you tell someone who loves Christ, it's not true. Because they see the purpose of grace. It's not to stimulate sin. It's to stimulate love. And love becomes the motivating factor, not law. Love becomes the motivating factor for us in all things in the Christian life to turn away from that which displeases our Lord and to turn to and to cultivate that which pleases Him because we love Him. So with that in mind, he's answering the question. You might expect him to say, well, let me modify the doctrines of grace. He doesn't modify the doctrines of grace. Instead, what does he do? (laughs) The one thing he does, the one thing he does when he says, shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? No. And the answer, Christ. And you say, wait a second. Here's the centrality of Christ. He doesn't give you law. He doesn't tell you what you must do in addition to understanding grace. He doesn't give you things you have to do. He points to Christ. He effectively says this, even the grace that abounds and the grace that reigns, all of that, even that grace that redeems sinners, that grace points them back to Christ. The gospel begins with the righteousness of God revealed in Christ and him crucified. That is objective. It's an object outside of any experience. It's objective. It is external. It's outside of you, and it is forensic or legal. It happens, and God declares something about you on the basis of it. But the gospel begins there. It doesn't end there. The gospel continues in the righteousness of Christ subjectively inside of us and not legal, but relational. It moves from the outside and it moves inside. How? Christ. The centrality of Christ is truly the issue. Let me just make an observation, and I want you to follow me in the logic here. Paul does not insist, like we often do, that sanctification is inseparable from justification. We do that. I do that. Because it's true. But that's not the point of this passage. And this is why. Because that little statement is not the answer to the real, practical, and painful struggle in the Christian heart when it deals with the temptations of sin. The answer is not, oh, well, sanctification can't be separated from justification. This is not a manual for sanctification. The answer is, Christ, you have been joined. To Christ. That's the answer. Consider how we often stress sanctification yet cannot be separated from justification, and then we don't know what to say when someone says, Yeah, well, what about the thief on the cross? Hmm. I'll tell you. Here's the issue. The link we're missing is something so precious. The link that's often missing in our thinking is reconciliation. You know what you should think first and foremost that cannot be separated from justification? Reconciliation. Why do I say that? Because reconciliation is underneath and it is the engine that drives sanctification. 
Because reconciliation is the doctrine that joins you to Christ. Here's the issue. You cannot be justified and not reconciled. The thief on the cross was reconciled to God. And that reconciliation is all that's needed for him to be glorified when he's taken out of this world. The issue is, I want you to hear this and get this right. There is no justification without reconciliation. The justification is heads on the coin. It's the legal side. Flip the coin over, it's the relational side. You see, Paul hasn't changed gears. He has stressed the legal side, the objective outside of you. And how is he moving into you? He's not moving into you with new law or commanding that you don't separate sanctification. He's moving into you by saying, yeah, well, the gospel's more than just legal. The gospel's relational. It actually connects you to Christ. I mean, this is amazing. The more I meditate on it, the more I am... Just amazed at the love of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And, and, and by the way, this reconciliation, he has been, he's already stressed it. I, I will just remind you, look back with me quickly, please, at, at chapter 5, verse 10. While we were enemies, we were what? Tell me. Reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are, tell me, reconciled shall we be saved by his life. For more than that, all, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received, tell me. And that's what he connects with justification before he even mentions anything about sanctification. The issue then, look at or consider 1 Peter 3.18. Here's the gospel in a nutshell. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Everything else follows. Sanctification flows out of union with Christ. So the issue that I'm after, I'm passionately seeing now, I'm so blessed by, is right here in Romans 6. Let's go back there. And, and, and look, at, look at this. Look at how this works out. Sanctification issues not from legal change. Did you hear me? Please hear me. Sanctification issues, it comes out of, not from legal change. Sanctification issues, it comes out of relational change. When you're declared right with God, that's not, that's not where sanctification comes. It's when you're joined to Christ. Now sanctification comes. Let me give you a lens to see that right there in Romans 6. Later, not today, but later, Paul's going to talk about but this idea of enslavement, being enslaved to a master. In biblical worldview, there's only two masters. God and whatever else label you want to give. The, the God of this world, yourself, whatever, it's a broad road to destruction. Sin. And here's the deal. Look at, verse, look at verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves? Now, here's the deal. He's going to say, by connecting to a master, by connecting to a master in relationship, it will result in what you do. So look at now in verse 19. At the end, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, that's joined to Christ and acting on that doctrine, that, by the way, beloved and friends, read the next word, leading to sanctification. So the doctrine here is that reconciliation, namely through that being joined to Christ, union with Christ is where Sanctification comes from. Now, with that in mind, I want to make certain that we understand that when we talk about being justified, it's not a legal fiction, it's a legal fact. It is the principle on which our practice 
precedes. We do look back to it and we are reminded and we're grounded in it. So that sanctification is the process of becoming in practice what we are in principle. We are declared right. And by being joined to Christ, we have a new ability and power to actually grow in the practice of what we are declared in principle. And love is the engine. Let me summarize this point, this first major principle, which is simply the centrality of Christ. Let me summarize it this way. When, when Christ is taken for no more than forgiveness of sins, then sanctification is completely lost. When you think of Christ as no more than a means to forgive your sins, then you cannot understand sanctification. You can't, even, you can't accomplish it. You'll never, you'll never go there. Here's, let me restate it this way. The gospel, when we do that, the gospel is reduced to dealing with our sins and not dealing with us. Did you hear that? Sometimes we throw around a gospel that just deals with sin and not with the sinner. But the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is more than a legal declaration. It moves in. With Christ at the center, it is the essential of all change. So that really, the glory of Romans 6 is seen in the centrality of Christ and not in the things we can do. His life, his death, his resurrection, these form the only hope of a sinner. The only hope to be right with God. Justification then has no other object to rely other than Christ. And so what we need to see is that that grace of the gospel that justifies also then abounds and reigns. That grace abounds and reigns so that redeemed sinners will grow in sanctification. And even this is centered on Christ. How? Well, that's my second point. Number two, it's centered on Christ through his union. Here's number two. Number, number one was centrality of Christ, principle of redeemed thinking, centrality of Christ, principle of redeemed thinking. Number two, focus on the gospel. Focus on the gospel. What I want you to see is that the union with Christ is the doctrine, but I want you to understand it through a focus on the gospel. I mean, let me say it this way. Understanding union with Christ is indispensable to the Christian life. Understanding union with Christ is absolutely essential if you are to love God. Now, here's what I mean by focus on the gospel. We are never told in Scripture that we were born with Christ or that we were Baptized with Christ. No. There's a focus on the gospel in our union. There's a focus on the gospel. And I invite you to look at it with me. First of all, look at verse six. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Crucified with him. So, crucified. That's a, that's a doctrine of the gospel. We are crucified with Christ. How about Galatians 2.20? I have been crucified with Christ. Well, that's one way that we are united to him in the gospel, focusing on the gospel, crucified. How about number two? Died. Look at verse eight, Romans 6, 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, also 2 Timothy 2.11 says, it's a trustworthy saving, for if we have died with him. So we've crucified, we've died with him, and we're also buried with him. Look at Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him. Never are we told we were born with him, we were baptized with him. No, 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 no. We were crucified with him. We, were, we died with him. We were buried with him. Now watch this. Not only buried, but made alive. Look at verse 8. 
At the end, we believe that we also will live with him. And this is exactly the point that Paul makes when he says in Ephesians 2.5 that even when we were dead in our trespasses, we were made, he made us alive together with Christ. Oh, so we were crucified with Christ. We died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We were made alive with Christ and we were raised with Christ. Look at Romans 6, 4 in the middle there. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Look at the end of verse 5. We are united, certain that we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. Or as Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we are raised up with Christ crucified with him, died with him, buried with him. We are made alive with him and we are raised up with him. Union with Christ has a focus on the gospel, not other things. You know that this is where cults and heresies and false teachers go way off. You know, we become gods and all these other things. No, 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 no. Our union with Christ is focused on the gospel. This is necessary for redeemed thinking. If we are to love God with our hearts, we've got to understand our focus in union with Christ must be on the gospel. That's the point. You know, I love the doctrine of the union with Christ. I mean, you think about union with Christ and you got, you, there's so much, so much, too much. But union with Christ reminds me of this, that this is not about my obedience. Should, should I obey? Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the answer to the question. And that's not the solution to the problem. The answer is union with Christ. And it's not merely obedience to Christ. Union with Christ means much more than I just now have a new master. As though now I just listened to a new command. As though now... Union with Christ is reduced to obedience to Christ. No, no, no. Union with Christ is something of incredible, precious comfort that I am joined with him, that he loves me, even as in a covenant of marriage. The two shall become one. All that is his now becomes mine. And all that is mine becomes his. But he does with my garbage. He deals with it to put it away forever. And says that's no longer part of us. Isn't that what Romans 6 goes on to say? That's where we're going. But before we do, I want us to remember... Here's another little thing to, to, to discipline our mind on. Union with Christ clearly means more than obedience to Christ. Union with Christ also teaches us that we don't simply add Jesus to our life. You don't run from that kind of teaching. You're living your life and you hear the gospel and, okay, what you're telling me is if I add Jesus, I'll have a better marriage I'll have better health. I might make more money. Things, I'll be happy. You're going to add Jesus. No, no, no. no. The, the gospel reconciles you to bring you to him, not to add him to you. Union with Christ. So, the doctrine of the gospel and reconciling us to God, the doctrine of uniting us to Christ is where we understand it's not about us getting something new, it's about us becoming something new. You, you, we see that? We don't add Christ to our life. No, we, we are brought to him. And he takes all that is ours and we receive all that is his. And in that transaction, he puts away the filth and the punishment of it. And in that in that glorious gift, we become something new. It's not that we receive, 
as though just receive something. No, we become something. It's, a, it's powerfully personal. I've said before, and let me say it again and stress it over and over till I get blue or something. The issue is this. Legalism is impersonal. It tells you, you have to do this, do this, do that, do that, or, or you, you, God won't love you. What? No, 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 no. This is, this is, the issue here is that we are justified, not our sin. It's very personal. I am justified. It wasn't just my sin. It's not that he took that off and now I'm, I'm the same me. No, I'm a new me. I'm now with Christ. You know, the issue here is that God justifies the ungodly. But he does not justify ungodliness. It's the person. And so, as I said last time with the analogy of marriage, if you're united to a beloved, you live different because of that union. Or what about, you know, any other, any other example, a prisoner being set free because of a union of sorts that one comes in and says, you're mine, you're mine, and I'm going to, I'll, I'll pay the debt and, and all this. And, and then you, you go back to the prison cell. That's absurdity. It's a contradiction to who you are in Christ. Well, I must move on to this idea of being united with Christ and its consequences, the ripple effect that it has and how it answers the question, well, then why do I still sin? And how do I overcome it? Are we talking paradoxes here? I mean, it seems like that. Because I think what Paul is teaching when he talks about us becoming what we are, I mean, sounds a little bit paradoxical, kind of like I'm journeying to the place that I stand presently. Hmm. Sort of like I'm becoming what I already am. But here's the difference. The practice, this is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful thing. Christ is transcendent. The same yesterday, today, and forever. We are not. By joining to Christ, however, we now have a new found link, union to him who is transcendent. So that my past and my future pouring in that truth even to my present change. The key that I'm getting at is, yes, I journey to the place where I presently stand because in Christ and only in Christ do I stand right with God. And that's transcendent. But in practice, in this very point in time, the, punct the punctiliar, I'm not as righteous as I ought to be. Take to heart the words of John Newton. Every justified Christian should have this in their heart well up every time and with tears. Both of sorrow and of gladness. That I am not the man I ought to be. I'm not the man I want to be. But I'm not the man I was. Because I'm with him. I am joined to Christ. So when you see words like, you have died with Christ, you have been crucified with Christ. In fact, that word, look at verse 6 with me. When he says this, you, we know that your old self, our old self, literally the old man, he only uses that three times, Paul does, only three times in the New Testament. And each time it's, it's a repudiation. It's negative. The old man is a despicable thing he wants to be rid of. He says, we know that the old man, verse 6, was crucified with him, was crucified. Now, when he says old man, he uses paleos, where you get paleontology, the study of ancient things, old things. The word actually, paleos, has the, the idea of being worn out. It's deprecated. It's had its use. It's done. It's gone. It's no longer to be used. That's paleos. It's not archaeos where you get archaeology. Archaeos is the idea that it's just old. It doesn't have any reference to its usefulness. Paleos says it has no use anymore. 
That's the old man justified. The, what justified sinner sees himself in union with Adam, sees himself walking in a depraved mind, sees himself sharing in the participation of human rebellion against God. That's an old man. That person in union with Adam is of no use to me. I'm new. I'm now in a new relationship. I'm in a new nature. I'm, I'm, I'm in a new participation. I have a new past. I have a new future. Therefore, my present ought to be new. Are you with me? This is the gospel that goes beyond the legal. It's relational. Connects us to Christ and changes everything. And so we see that we know now in Christ what it means to be crucified. Well, I think we do. I wonder if you do. I, 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 pastorally, I do want to touch on this. I, I want to help in any way I can to really help bring this out. When Paul says we are crucified with him or when we died with him, he uses a tense that, that is unique here in Romans. He doesn't use this in Galatians when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. The other two times he says it. He uses a different tense here. And this tense here says, it speaks clearly of a singular one point in time that's passed and done and completed. That's the idea. And what significance does that have? Well, it, 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 it invites all kinds of questions. Like, when was I crucified with Christ? When? And, and this is where I pray this would help you because some go there in this idea, I would say that I've read enough to, to really prompt me to share with you. There's, there's a lot of ink spilled on this subject, and, and a lot of it tends to go from the, the physical in, right immediately into the metaphysical. Like We've got to now become philosophers or something to understand any of this. No, I don't think so. I don't also think that it's a mystery religion. I don't think it's mystical in the sense that when we can't figure this out. This is, I don't understand. This is just something in the, in the gray. We just... It doesn't have, why do, I, why do I want to show you and draw your attention to see that's not how you should think? You know why? Because if that's how you think, if your view of this union with Christ is fogged up and cloudy and blurry and you can't see 10 feet in front of you, how is that going to help you to overcome sin? It's not. No, I think, I think it's actually very clear. So this is what I want to do. I want to encourage you, let us not oversimplify this by reducing it to some kind of a metaphor of our own conversion. A lot of people think, well, uh, what, he say is, what he says here is that I've been crucified with Christ, that that was when I converted. Well, that's not exactly right. <laughs> because you got to catch this. Christ isn't crucified over and over. He's not newly crucified every time a person comes to him. This is a problem that, by the way, reformers have always had with the, the, the formal teaching of the Mass, that Christ is crucified. He's offered up again and again and again. So it's not our conversion. Then what is it? Well, it is true that our union with Christ is initialized by our conversion, at our conversion. But the focus here in Romans 6 is not on our conversion. The focus here in Romans 6 is not even on us. The focus here in Romans 6 is on Christ. And all the tenses used are about what Christ did historically. So... Being united to Christ links us to all that he is and all that he has done. So at the moment of your conversion, when you were placed in union with Christ, at that moment, you were linked to his death, burial, and resurrection. His. You were brought in union with him who did that. And how then does this play out? At the moment of your conversion, 
Listen carefully because this goes right into the next point. At the moment of your conversion, you were counted as Christ. So that his death paid for your sins. How? Because when God punished him 2,000 years ago, and you weren't born until just a few years or good decades ago, how does that work? It's the very same way. Don't be confused. This is clear. You are joined to Christ in union with Christ, and immediately you become a benefactor. You become an heir of all that he is and has done. So that when he died, he says, no, that death that I died, I died for you. So that you can see and understand you're in union with me as though you were with me there. As though you, as though, catch that, as though. Because of all of who I am and all that I've done, you now are a benefactor. It is as though you have died to the old self. The key then, again, is this count it, isn't it? Count it. If we were counted as one with Christ when we are put in union, if we are counted as one with Christ, then it means that we are counted as crucified with Christ. And it means that we are counted as buried with Christ. And it means that we are counted as raised with Christ. Never to die again. Counted. This is exactly where it goes. This is exactly where the text must go. Here's, here's, a, here's a helpful thing for me. I hope it is for you. Vantage point. We are very self-centered people. We tend to say, this doctrine doesn't make sense because from my vantage point, okay, that's the problem. There you go. Let's just scrap that. And let's start over. Okay. From the view of Christ, when you were joined to him, all that he is and all that he's done, he sees, you've been crucified with me. From our vantage point, we might not feel it. We might not experience it. We might not understand the metaphysics of it. But this is the, this is the clarity. From the view of God, you are counted righteous. Because you are counted as one with Christ. And therefore, beloved and friends, I hasten now to our final principle. And that is the discipline of the mind. Listen. You exist to love God. Sin separates. The mind's defunct. Cannot. Christ comes objectively pays and does all that's necessary to remove the obstacle and then joins you to him. So you, like Christ, can love the Lord your God. Here's the challenge. This is something that you might not always feel and you might not sense in experience, but you must believe by faith and exercise by faith. Just as God says, look, I count you as crucified and raised with Christ. He then turns and look at verse 11 with me. And he says, so you also, you also now, the focus here isn't on what you can do in death or burial or resurrection, but what you must do in terms of your thinking. You must, and the word here, legizomai, consider is the word count. You must count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So here's the, here's the beautiful progress. God all this time in Romans has said, this is what I'm counting. Now you must count. Now watch this. Out of Romans, the very first commandment given to the Christian, the very first exhortation, the very first imperative it's right here. And it's not for you to do something with your hands or accomplish something religiously. It's for you to think a certain way. Because the, the imperatives are always grounded in the indicatives. 
Who you are always gives rise to then what you must do. And nowhere is this more excellent than in Romans. Because Romans is all about pressing this glorious gospel on us. And our first reaction is our first responsibility must be the mind. What we do with the mind. Not what we do with our hands and religion and all the things we accomplish. No, the mind, how we think about this. And he's calling us to do nothing more than he has done. He says, my child, I know that you're not what you ought to be or what you even want to be, but you're not what you were. Because I count you this way. So now you count yourself that way. And discipline the mind. My first point was this Christ-centered. My second point was the focus on the gospel. And my closing point is you have to discipline the mind. Listen, what good is discipline of anything in your life if it doesn't come from the fountain, the very source of all your life? Proverbs, let me give you three things. I know I'm out of time, so I, I, I just summarize. The three things that I would say for the discipline of the mind, you have a whole series you can listen to, 16 messages. I'm not going to do that in two minutes, so here we go. Just the thing I want to give you is count yourself. This means this. The mind that you had apart from Christ was defunct. It, it could not love God. But when you are joined to Christ, you're given a new mind. So the first thing I encourage you to do to count yourself, to discipline your mind, is this. Defend your new heart. Defend the regenerate you. Defend the new self. Defend the new birth. Defend you who are made in Christ. Defend it. You know what that means? That means guard it. Like Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. All of life come out of your mind. Your body will never do anything morally that your mind does not tell it to do. You are not a victim of sin. You are a chooser of sin. Your mind is the issue. It's what you think on. And by the way, your mind will actually affect your feelings and your mind will actually affect your emotions and your mind must therefore lead them. Don't ever follow your heart, lead your heart. You take your mind and you understand it must, number two, direct your thoughts. You defend the regenerate heart. Secondly, direct your thoughts. Direct your thoughts. So when you're tempted... You defend that glorious gift of the new heart and you say, I am, I'm crucified with Christ. That man's dead. I can't respond to that temptation. And then secondly, you redirect your thought. You direct your thought to that which would please him. And thirdly, you develop the mind. You defend it, you direct it, and you develop it. That means character is cultivated. It doesn't happen in a decision. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen with a message or a sermon or a conference. It takes life. It takes discipline. It takes constant cultivation. And habits strengthen habits. Begin the habit of redirecting the mind and develop that over and over and over. Count yourself crucified with Christ. Count yourself raised with Christ. And there, you will taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's not about what you can do. But what you will do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the gift you've given in Christ and the clarity of the gospel. Apply it to our hearts in a powerful way, I ask. May we have the centrality of Christ in our minds. May we focus on the gospel in our union with Christ. And may we discipline our minds to constantly preach the gospel to us over and over and over. You are worthy. We are grateful. In Christ's name, amen.